The following is a presentation of the Six Arrows Radio Network. Welcome to the Ham Radio 360 podcast with your host, K4 CDA, K4 CDA, Kale Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's cold, man. I'm here in South Carolina. It's wintertime. It feels uh, cold everywhere else as well. This this may not be winter when you're listening to the program, so uh, let me feel sh- officially welcome you into the Ham Radio 360 podcast. My name is Kale. Been podcasting for a while about Ham Radio and invite you to uh, check out our back catalog where we've got some pretty amazing stuff listed as well as the part one of this interview. Yeah, number uh, 89 was uh, part one with Bryce and Brent uh, from Faraday RF. Hope you guys enjoyed that. A good look into the millennial mind of the ham radio operators who were following us into the hobby and looking to make not only a mark, but uh, helping to carry this thing forward into the 21st century. And, uh, and they're going at it headlong. So Really excited about that. Uh, I don't want to talk too much because uh, what is there to say other than I've got some great content following this intro. So, again, welcome. You can learn more about this and more at hamradio360.com. I like talking better than listening. You mean this isn't? You mean this isn't a video blog? No, sorry. <laughs> That's the, the wrong guy. You're on the wrong show. Ah, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Guys, it, it's it's been fun it, so far, and I've learned a lot from you both. But I want to talk about I, – I really want to learn from you now uh, about your project. You guys are in space, not right now, but you have a project that is currently <laughs> orbiting the Earth. Uh, I want to talk about that first, and then I want to talk awesome. about uh, – what is Faraday RF and, and why is it as awesome as I think it is with my minimal understanding of it? But first tell me how two twin brothers were became a part of something that's now in space. Because to me, that's just freaking awesome. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess I'll take it. The uh, I guess the, the distinction there is we, we both actually have, I guess we both have amateur and non-amateur equipment in space. So like it's kind of a gray line for us because you know our, we professionally work work in aerospace and you know we have our, our circuit boards and stuff in space and orbit um i think one of my boards is in like heliocentric orbit it's like trailing the earth for another billion years or something which is kind of <laughs> cool um uh i forget if brent brent has brent has a few out there too but um you know that's obviously not with amsat that's that's with spacex but um for the amsat stuff um it's uh, that was volunteer work. That was it, it started prior to Faraday RF, but it definitely intermingled with Faraday RF, uh, especially the the flight version of the maximum PowerPoint tracker, which is now flying on uh, Rad FX Sat AO ninety one. Um, like that actually really mingled pretty hardcore with Faraday RF because uh, right when we were finishing that project up, um, we were starting Faraday, and um, we kind of had to do this tag team of working on Faraday and working on the MPPT. Um, which was which was just an interesting way to start start the whole project, but uh, it it was a whirlwind of, of work to get something in space, and uh, yeah, space is hard. Space is it, you have to cross your t's and dot your eyes. That's for sure. <laughs> you you can't well, mess I, up. No, you. Yeah, I mean, there's no way to fix it. <laughs> You're done. Um, well, I'd like to like to add there that um, the, yeah, Bryce and I uh, we we were always very interested in AMSAT and, you know, and, and we listened to some satellites go over, you know, when we we're in high school. Um, I remember SuitSat trying to listen to that uh, with, with, with her dad as it, when it was released, I guess, late 2000s or, or, or such, um, mid 2000s, and um, never thought I'd be working in it. And when we went to college, you know, we realized through our projects in the radio club that, that uh, especially with the high altitude balloon, that, whoa, like we can actually do this stuff and and it's fun and and it's it really grabbed my interest. I think, and I think Bryce agrees with this. Um, uh, my interest in electronics, um, is not as much into like cool projects as much as it is to work on something that is larger than than just myself. And it it work on something that is very yeah I'd um, agree. yeah that is very um um it may not be the best radio or the best MPPT or or such, but it is something that is is like a remote electronics thing that really interests me um getting yeah, something it's, to work. it's designed for a specific purpose yeah like, like faraday is designed for a specific purpose um 
not necessarily the the to be the best you know uh, all around highest speed highest power radio it's just as the mppt is not the most efficient or the lowest sports base mppt it's designed for a very specific reason on it by msat um and yeah those types of projects end up oftentimes being finished <laughs> uh, yep. when you kind of constrain <laughs> uh, uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to, to finish there that, um, that when Bryce and I had our, our internship at, at SpaceX at the end of our, of our college uh, uh, days, that um, we came back from that. And I remember uh, uh, our dad came out to Los Angeles uh, to drive back with us because we had driven to, space, uh, to, to Los Angeles and we're driving back and we took the um, path up, up relatively north and we went through the Dayton Hambenton and we were like, okay, this is our time to go to Dayton Hambenton for the first time. So we did and we were going this around. Is that 2012? And, yep, 2012. And we ended up um, meeting uh, uh, Tony, uh, Tony A- 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 yep. A2TX. Uh, from AMSA. He's the, he was the head of engineering at the time. He's now, uh, he's now passed away. Uh, but it, it started off this, this, this great conversation where we wanted to be more involved. And, and they gave us a project at first, which, was, um, which was, 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 hey, we want you to build this little piece of test gear. It was an active load. So basically, it's like a variable constant current resistor, um, for the, for the, if you can think about it that way, uh, so that you can simulate you know, a satellite or simulate a solar panel. Uh, you can use it in different ways to, to do these things. And, um, and we, 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 we built one, you can buy these commercially, but really what they were doing is they were, I think, kind of figuring out who we were and also giving us a, a project to say, here's a project that you can start. That's, that's, that not, it's not critical, uh, but it'll help us. It also, um, you know, it was a skills building thing. And, and I think that was, that was really cool. I'm not sure if that's something they, they normally do. Uh, but it, it was great to be, to feel like we were part of that. Yeah. Of that uh, of that community, and it also gave us gave us some experience. We we finished that, and um, after finishing that, that 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 project, we then went. Uh, we were we were going into our into our, into our, our final year of, of of college, and we needed a senior design project. And we and we decided, hey Tony, we wanna we wanna build we wanna build something for you uh, for our senior design. And it turned out that they needed a maximum PowerPoint tracker. Uh, to maximize the, the power from the solar panels for their three U CubeSats and up. Um, so we decided to take it on. And we had a few of our friends from the radio club uh, at RIT that were also graduating with us um, join our team. And we put the whole project together, had an amazing group of, uh, of, uh, of teammates and, and, and advisors. And um, yeah, we didn't know what we were jumping into. We were working like forty-hour yeah. weeks every week. It was <laughs> a had, lot of work. We had never, we had never um, yeah, we had. I mean, we had never built an MPBT. We didn't know anything about really power systems. We just knew we could learn it. And that's one of the things that like the internship at SpaceX really taught us was, uh, um, confidence goes a long way. Like, it, I know a lot of people like will like confuse like confidence and ego. Like, mm-hmm. it's not that like I know everything. It's just like you know what? If I put my mind to it, I will probably figure out. And I'm not afraid to ask how to do something like that it, learning is amazing. And that allows you to, to, uh, really accomplish some cool things and learn stuff. Like it took, I remember, Oh man, like the, the, the group at RIT, I mean, we're all, I mean, I'm so proud of that team, but we, we were sitting there at like two in the morning, <laughs> like some December cold Rochester. I mean, Rochester is always cold, but like <laughs> some, like <laughs> some like really cold night. I mean, we were in kind of known as that team that was just always in the lab. And, um, and that's why we chose that. Like, that's why we work with Dan and, and Ian on the project was like, we knew that they would, they would be committed to it just like us. And, uh, we're banging our heads. Like, how does this MPPT work? Cause it's so weird. If you, if you look at, um, the, the best way to describe an MPPT is when you, when you know how a voltage regulator works, you know, you're regulating the output voltage, mm-hmm. you know, you have random, not random, but you have variable input voltage and you, you kind of have a rock solid output voltage. Well, MPPT is kind of the other way around. It's you're modulating the input, which is really, really funky <laughs> Like to think about. Like, well, how do I change the input? If I put like five volts in, uh, what's changing that? And like the reality is that solar panels are somewhat high impedance. So as you pull current from them, the voltage drops. So that's how this whole process gets started. And remember, it just clicked for us. We're all sitting there like two in the morning, dead tired, like stumped. We just we, we needed to figure this out. And then it was really cool. And when we just suddenly realized, oh, 
like that happens when 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 you're when we realize the the, the input impedance and like an, an MPPT is essentially just it's like it's it's basically a tuner like it's it's, it's almost like a, an antenna tuner but for power you're you're matching impedances the the input of a, a high power radio is relatively low impedance and the output of the solar panel is kind of high impedance uh, so you you're you're matching them to provide that maximum power transfer nice um, and it was like yeah. the hallelujah chorus started and you had it yeah, well, like, like well, I mean, we still had a lot of work left, but um, there was a fundamental yeah. roadblock of like, wait, how does this thing, like, how do we look at even accomplishing this? Right. Um, and um, we still had tons of work on even how to how to implement it in hardware. Um, and that was, but that was a cool moment. I remember, and that was not, to me, that was kind of the epitome of, we didn't really know what we were doing when we went into it, but we all like knew that we would work for it. And we all knew that we would, we would give it a shot. And, uh, that was really cool to have that payoff. And, uh, AMSAT trusted us with that, which is cool. I mean, they, they put us on a far up. I mean, the, the original satellite we were working on has, has not even been built yet. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, but, um, you know, it, it did give them this, I, this, uh, intellectual property essentially of, of an MPPT. Um, if you'd like, we can go more into like the design of it and how it works. I'm not sure what, where you want to go with that. Well, uh, you know, I'm just curious, um, uh... I mean, you said they were it, well, the other project they gave you was commercially available. This was not in the form factor, I guess, that you needed it for. It actually is. It is. It is. So, so it. I guess you have to be careful with the commercially available. So, um, we implemented an analog computer essentially. Like it is literally the MPPT on Rad FXAT is an analog computer. It is using op amps uh, to compute uh, y equals negative M- mx plus b. It's literally doing a math equation, um, and that allows us to predict the voltage. Now, that's not the best way to do MPPT. Um, uh, the most widely used way is what's called perturb and observe. So you essentially change the voltage of the solar panel, then you multiply your measured current and your, your panel voltage to get power, and then you say, did the power increase? If it did, you move in the same direction. If it went down, you move in the opposite direction. So you perturb it, you change it, and then you observe what is the power. And then, so you do, you essentially climb the hill of power until you get to the top. And then you stay there. If, as the MPP, uh, if, as the maximum power point changes, you change with it. Uh, so one of the huge advantages of that method is you, uh, you don't need to know what the solar panel is that you hooked up to. It can be any solar panel. Um, the method we chose is you have to get the exact solar panel right. Like we does, like our MPPT will only work with two like two series uh, uh, special lab UTJ solar cells. Like it is designed for it. Uh, and you know the fun the funny part I always joke about is if you can't guarantee on a satellite w- what your solar panels are, like you have other problems because you know <laughs> <laughs> you got an acquisition yeah, issue crazy. there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um but the reason we did that was because of radiation. So when you when you're doing perturb and observe, you have state. So this is a thing in in the space world where when you hold state in my control, like if I multiply um current times voltage measurements, I have in memory somewhere an equation, right, that's in, in programming uh, in, in bits that is telling these two values that I've measured to get multiplied. And then uh, the result is also stored in some part of memory. Now, y- you could have a cosmic ray or some type of radiation come by and flip a zero to a one or a one to a zero or cause something. And then you're done. Like, Mission over. It's it's <laughs> it's end game, and uh, oftentimes, or you get weird operation. Um, and to use systems like this in orbit, you you have to be really tricky. Like you have to have th- like say three versions of your software in three different physical parts of memory, and then like always check between them. And you know whatever. If one of the three disagrees, you then like rewrite that entire one with all the other two's copy. Right. You, mm-hmm. Two out of three vote for what is the firmware I should have. Okay. That that's really hard to do. Like it's it's a lot of work, and that's like a whole project in and of itself beyond MPPT. But if you look at what we did, it's it's an analog computer. Like you can't. There's no programming in it. It is hardwired to to do this one math equation that predicts the where the voltage should be based on temperature, and um, it is operating basically as fast as the op amps will, will allow it to to operate, and 
no bit flip will ever change that. I mean, the, the satellite will basically have to uh, get a total, I, um, what was it, total ionospheric dose, TID, um, enough ionizing basic dose. ionizing dose, that's it, to basically take down the whole satellite before it dies. Like, it's, it's, it's a very robust way of doing it. So you can buy the perturbed and observe, you know, ones on the market for CubeSats. Uh, because most CubeSat missions are like six months, where the the, the likelihood of getting a uh, a radiation event is pretty low, whereas AMSAT wants this thing to operate for at least five years, and then if they're in like a you know they they go anywhere between like ten and twenty year orbits depending on the launch, and you really want to get ten or twenty years out of it if you can, and that's really hard to do without some really tricky radi- uh, radiation tolerant uh, design. So, I mean, really, <laughs> this is Kel's way of, of understanding what you just said. There's lots of ways to do it on the cheap, but if you want it to really last, you almost have to go back in time to do things the old way instead of depending on, like you said, the digital technology, the analog technology is what you're using, switches and transistors and hard programming versus bits and dashes and dots that, change according to the temperature or whatever you've you've put the values in here and this is what they are kind of a thing yeah i mean it's it depends right so like amsat's a volunteer organization and you know one of the hard parts about a volunteer organization is that people come and go like uh as as brett and i know from 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 even even work like the designing the circuit or designing the the solution is fun but getting it to orbit like getting all your your t's crossed and your eyes dotted so where when it is on a vehicle sitting on the launch pad and, and you know of you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars you know for that launch mm-hmm. and you know it's going to work like you're sure of it that is painful like getting something there is 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 kind of painful it takes a lot of work and to do that with say digital circuits takes takes a real lot of time and the amount of effort that would be necessary to go into doing that uh, would require quite a few people to to work for a while on on implementing, say, a computer system like that. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, if you have people who understand, say, some basically op amp technology and in in the power conversion technology, uh, you could say take this analog method of doing it, and uh, and you don't need that team of programmers and that team of of of, um, of software developers, right? Uh, you can get that done with a much smaller team, and it's also really scalable. So uh, there's a few components on the design you change out, and you know the thing could do like 50 watts. Uh, so I mean, it's pros and cons. Like honestly, if we had had uh, more people to kind of work on them and more time to work on that project, and our goal was to develop like the most efficient one, we probably would have done perturb and observe with digital electronics. But that wasn't the actual goal of it. So I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's really cool because it's almost like going back and using what it took to get us to the moon versus what, you know, is technology super readily available today. What people think, maybe how people think that it should be done or is done, maybe not be because there are other ways to do it. And it doesn't have to be the latest and greatest. It has to be what works and is going to work and has been proven to work without any hiccups. Well, uh, I, I, I want to... Yeah, it, yeah, I'll add, I'll add that, that although that's 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 like mostly there. Yeah. What what the analog method allows us to do is is uh, is also to fail gracefully, where uh, where <laughs> yeah, exactly. a oh a, these a are things to think about in the space world. <laughs> yep. So so it, with a microcontroller, like you can you can test it in a radiation beam. Um, you know, there's data online. NASA has an online database. You can just go in, in Google, um, and and uh, other universities have done this. You can go and put these electronics in in a radiation beam and get like a get like an idea of how this will react with a certain amount of radiation dose. Mm-hmm. Um, and with with microcontrollers, some of them last. Um, a lot of them don't last much at all. Um, some of them, like the MSP430, uh, like like the type that we use in Faraday, actually, um, actually lasts a decent decent a while within radiation. But the problem is, is that it's all probability, and if something flips, you're probably just done. You have to reset or handle it grace hand handle it like with the reset, or it might just kill it outright. But it's it, it's more of a um, either or. Right. Whereas with um with with like more more analog electronics that are that are stateless. What you get is you get things that parameters like on a data sheet, they'll shift over time. Uh, so it's a little bit more predictable. 
Um, so that was so with the stateless design, and we were using we we limited our component components that we used to ones that had testing data that said this will last to at least thirty thousand rad of radiation over the course of life, which is about right. what the orbit was about was, five years, was, yeah, was, in low yeah. Earth orbit. And now the likelihood of a, of getting that radiation dose is pretty low, but it was the upper limit of it, so so it's likely going to last a lot longer. The other thing is that it's 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 you, there's there's the design, it's fairly robust, um, and you can scale it. But also, people can look at it and go, okay, like like uh, if you know power supply design and other analog electronics, you can go and figure out this MPPT. Uh, kind of going back to one of our prior comments was that um, one of the things that is missed a lot within side of um, electronics itself, or even ham radio, is that it's really easy to focus on how to make something the best. It's really easy to go and say, "Oh, this, this. Why isn't this? You know, this, 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 this really great SDR or this radio's, um, you know, noise rejection." Uh, the the thing that's really hard to do is look at the big picture. Why are you doing this? What are you trying to solve? And how do you do the minimal minimal amount with the things you have at hand to do it? And you might make the wrong decision at first, or you might make the right decision. But the the point is, is that within anything that you're engineering uh, is to see the big picture. It also gives you time, right? Like if we had focused on um, building the best MPPT um, ever, we don't really need it. And the goal was to get it on the vehicle and get it into orbit um, for a launch deadline, right? Like you, same thing for people working on like um, some of the best SDRs and stuff like that is if you spend years working on this one thing, then maybe technology walks by you in other areas uh, if, I guess if that makes sense oh yeah yeah and I, I think I've learned a couple of things here <clears throat> is that uh, our friends who are participating in AMSAT and chasing satellites with their HTs and era Yagi antennas they probably don't think a whole lot about what you guys did and what you created to get this thing so that they can talk back and forth on it, number one. And I think the second point I've gotten here from you guys is as we move toward Faraday RF, I think I realize now the reasoning behind what you did and how you did and why you did things there versus maybe conventional wisdom. And uh, I'm guessing we can kind of go that direction towards Faraday RF. Uh, but but there may sure. be some comments that you have for our friends at AMSAT who are enjoying the oh. birds out there. Uh, and you guys have, you know, pieces of tech on there uh, flying around. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, first off, I think you're, you're, probably, you're probably hitting the nail on the head with the um, reasoning behind Faraday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Brent would agree in that. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, first off, on, on AMSAT um, – uh, I'll touch upon the engineering. Uh, there is a small army of AMSAT engineers, and Brent and I are just two of them. Um, and it's it's incredible because there's, you know, people come and go. And, you know, Brent and I have come and gone. We've definitely backed off a bit to do Faraday. Um, you know, we work a lot with with Jerry and Zero JY, uh, Jerry Buxton, uh, who's the AMSAT uh, VP of engineering. And uh, But there's a small army of, of people working on it that uh, most of the time you never hear about or – you don't realize they're not, they're generally not the ones you hear on the satellites. A lot of us just, we get kicks out of like <laughs> enabling people to operate on them. Like, like I, I have yet to actually talk on AO 91. I mean, I don't really have the radio set up for it. It's kind of hard in LA to do that, but, um, I get kicks out of hearing how much pe people enjoy working it. And, and, and that to me is, that's what I love about ham radio is enabling other people to have fun and enjoy things and, and put a smile on their face essentially. I don't know if Brent has anything more on that. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there, Bryce. And um, it's it's really amazing what the what the organization does. Um, they're always looking for more help. Uh, it's a great avenue. I mean, it is amazing. This is literally, I, I don't know if there is another, but it is the only that I know about organization that you can volunteer, technical or non technical, um, not in the space industry, you know, very, um, and get something of yours in the space or help achieve that um, without being in a university and or in the aerospace industry. Uh, and yeah, I think it also goes to one of the points that Bryce and I have made on some of our, our more recent blog posts on, on, on FaradayRF.com, which is that, that AMSA is a great example of how amateur radio is not just about the radio. And it, it's, it's about the whole community 
the systems, uh, where, how can you use radio or apply radios or the amateur radio culture in different ways? Um, because the radio circuitry on AO91 is one of several circuit boards that do different things. There are solar panels, the maximum PowerPoint tracker, there's a computer, there's an experimental board, um, there's, whole, there's the radio battery board. board. Yep, whole battery board. Uh, there's the mechanical structure of it, so there's mechanical engineering design in it. They have to do logistics. They have to do all this coordination. <laughs> oh, man, the amount of testing to get something even bolted to the side of a rocket. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. You know, oh, you're my, literally, oh, man. You're, you're I mean, I see it professionally and with AMSAT. It's just like the amount of testing is insane. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll literally take these things, and whether you're doing engineering testing or you know, pr- proving the, uh, the uh, flight unit, you know, you're taking it and putting it inside of a thermal chamber where you're bringing it to really, really cold temperatures and really, really hot temperatures and just doing it for days. Or you're taking it on and putting on this, this, this basically giant speaker that will shake a very heavy things to uh, you know, thousands of hertz of, uh, of, of vibration uh, energy. And you're going to shake and simulate what a rocket launch will do. And you know, you're taking this little CubeSat and putting on, someone has to go and design that test, has to go bring it there, which is usually Jerry and, and you know, some other people, and, and go do this. So it's amazing that... Yeah, um, some of us operate on, 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 on AM91, but a lot of us get enjoyment out of building it and out of seeing people use it. And I've heard it go over, and it's amazing to hear it go over, um, but I don't have a huge drive to actually use it because I feel that my place on it was helping build it, and I'll eventually use it, and it's fun, but I enjoy seeing other people get their, use it in, 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 in how they want to use it. Kind of like Walt Disney building Disney World for people to enjoy. And and Walt probably had a great time enjoying Disneyland or Disney World. (laughs) But he he had as much fun seeing the kids come in the gate and and jumping on the the log ride or whatever. That fulfilled him. He didn't have to go and do it himself. Uh, Yeah, it sounds right. I imagine that's similar. Uh, Kale, actually, it reminds me of when we're talking about, like, vibration testing and, like, you know, shaking the satellite. Yeah. uh, there's something that most people don't realize about rockets, and uh, which is kind of cool. When you, um, when <laughs> sorry, I have a dog in the background. Uh, when you, um, when you, when you launch, uh, actually, one of the hardest parts and most vibration and shaking parts of the ride is like the first couple seconds, and that's because you have these massive rocket engines that are, you know, blowing, you know, thousands upon thousands of pounds of fuel out per second uh, of the engines. And all of that acoustic energy, you, you hear that rumble in the distance. Well, only like a couple hundred feet away is the ground, which reflects all of it. Mm-hmm. It comes right back up and then couples right into the, the entire rocket and shakes the rocket really hard. And then once you get far enough away from the rock, from the ground, those reflections don't hit you anymore and things calm down. Uh, but yeah, that, those first couple seconds are like some of the most violent parts of a ride uh, to space. I did the... Uh did the Atlantis thing at uh, Kennedy back at, almost a year ago now. And uh, we're, the simulator that they say simulates it as close as they can simulate it without killing you and or being real. <laughs> and uh, they, they lean you back. And I think that, that my cheeks right below my eye, the, the cheek, the skin over my cheekbone there was back around my ear uh, during that, that shaking and, the audio it was just a it was crazy i was like my face is distorted and i'm not but it felt like i was moving but i wasn't moving but I, I get what you're saying and even even there they were talking about how if you stand if you were to try to stand so close um to the actual pad whether it was spacex or the other rockets that they launched down there uh just the sound the the, oh, the yeah. force the energy of the sound would kill you Oh yeah, and the, absolutely. My my kids were saying, "Dad, is that true?" I'm like, hey, "Yeah, it'll kill you. It'll kill you quick." But it's loud. It's, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I, yeah. So I mean, that's any any rocket. Yeah. Yeah, and and there they are, and it's just amazing technology, and and you guys are, are part of it, which is really cool. Amsat, I have yet. I'm I'm yet to try Amsat, but you should you should get Jerry should, get your, you should get Jerry Buxton on on the radio here. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We've talked to um, Let's do that. We've talked to Andrew. Uh, his last name awesome. just left me. Um, uh, Glassbrenner. Oh yeah, Glassbrenner. Glassbrenner. Yes, Glassbrenner. Yep. Yes. Um, and that, <laughs> it was a crazy call. There was a, a hurricane coming on on shore, <laughs> and you could hear the rain <laughs> in the background during the whole oh, call. Man. It was like, 
So yeah, that was living in Florida, but but it's some really cool stuff. I need to I need to kind of fool with it more. Or I think my kids really get a kick out of it once, especially they hear this. But as we were talking a few minutes ago and talking about building basically a redundant system to survive that doesn't require this digital technology, when I was reading the Faraday RF website and you sent me the links that said, try this, read this first, read this second, because I was trying to get my head around what are these guys doing? Because it looks and sounds really cool, but if you're not an electrical engineer or not on that level, I was left scratching my head. What I loved about what you what you guys wrote, what one of the things that really caught my eye was this is not an SDR. Now that not that doesn't say that I don't like SDR because I've got some and they're fun. I think they're really cool oh, they're technology. Awesome. But what in the world is Faraday RF? And then what are you guys making underneath that banner? Uh, Bryce, did, did you want to take it? You want me to take it? Uh, sure. I'll, um, I'll always, I'll always, I'll always uh, answer the the first part of um, of. Faraday uh, RF is is obviously the company that Brett and I have started, and uh, our first radio is Faraday. And as you stated, it's not an SDR, and that's, there's nothing we have nothing against SDRs. Um, it is actually it's a hardware defined radio. We used a, uh, a CC430 uh, radio, which is a nice Texas Instruments chip that does about 500 kilobaud uh, uh, data rate. You know, it uses um serv- it has several various modulation schemes in it uh the one that we use the most is is two fsk um but uh, i think building upon what we you know profess with say amsat work and in in just our our view on engineering in general is is you really want to figure out what should i be building like what is my goal and the reason we really emphasize this is not an sdr is because if we had built an sdr we're focusing on the wrong problem. Like Brent and I are very passionate about the fact that ham radio needs better applications. Like we need to, we need to not, the focus of it isn't necessarily building the radio. It's doing stuff with it. And that's where Faraday comes in. We focused on uh, building software and building an infrastructure that uh, lets us do stuff with it as opposed to spending all this time trying to design a new modulation scheme, right? Like, um, like I really enjoy the, the, the codec two project. Like it's really neat. Um, uh, the call signs for, for um, escaping me of, of who's working on that. Uh, but, uh, it, it's great that they're fitting like the, the audio down into a really tiny, uh, uh, bandwidth. I think they're down to 700 bits per second or something, but, um, they, that, that's taken a long time to do. And if, that's that's the goal of the project, and that's awesome. But um, like from our aspect, um, we don't want like the lowest bandwidth possible. We want to use the bandwidth we have and do interesting things with it. If that makes sense, uh, I don't know if Brent has a better way of saying it, but uh, yeah, kind of the high level view of that. Yeah, uh, that that was a great overview, uh, uh, Bryce. And um, the so we are. Our view with, with Faraday is that the largest problem to the future of ham radio is how do you use ham radio in the 21st century? And uh, it's obviously digital. And uh, making the best software-defined radio uh, or making a software-defined radio doesn't necessarily solve that problem. But it's how do we use it? And um, like for example, with Faraday, we have 500 kilobits per second of, of, of possible uh, speed where there's no reason to spend time on using codec two for us, uh, infinite 700 baud. You just take open source libraries online that you can download in, you know, in a minute and have, you know, have digital audio, uh, if you'd want to do that, uh, and send it through data. At the end of the day, data is data. Digital audio is data with voice encoded in it. It's still data. And so the point that Faraday is really pushing ahead is how do we use data within ham radio uh, where it's not just an APRS uh, uh, style um, messaging or information system, and it's not just replacing the internet. And um, to your point, Kale, there, uh, our website does have a lot of information. It's, it's at this point, I think, a little bit outdated. We're going to go back and um, simplify it a lot more and, and clarify, especially for those who aren't as um, – uh, knowledgeable about like the technical back end, uh, but I'll I'll give an I, I'll give an example of where Faraday really fits in and shows where we want to bring ham radio. Ham radio. Um, 
Faraday itself is a digital radio that you can use as a as its own little computer and like smart node, kind of like an APRS tracker. Uh, we've actually flown Faraday on a, a high altitude balloon over the Sequoias uh, in California here to about thirty thousand feet. It was a bunch of party city balloons. Uh, it, 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 was, it was it was a very quick. Very, very yeah. quick way to do it. Uh, I'm uh, seeing yeah, the, the RIT movie. one was much better. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah it was some, very much like that. It was, it was a Gladware container from our kitchen, things like that. But uh, it, 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 it worked. And, um, but it's also, I've also transferred files over it from radio to radio. We're right now working on a lot of software and actually going into our, um, into our current direction of making it very simple to use and very, uh, uh, very expandable. Uh, and we can, I think that's maybe better for uh, an, an, another talk, but um, one of the applications that is unique to ham radio that other internet hardware and uses don't provide are things like, um, are things like the last 10 miles. And you could go, uh, in addition to that, things like delay tolerant networks, which for those of you who don't know what that is, are things like, um, how do I transfer information between two stations or, or, two, or two units um, when they don't have connection all the time. So, for example, if I'm, and the example I give is ham radio fits, fits the bill for, like, if I'm hiking or backpacking out in the mountains, um, or lay, say I'm just doing a cross-country drive and I'm in the middle of the desert and I have no APRS signal, um, it, it, it's really unfortunate when you're driving and APRS gives out and then it just pops back in later on and you have this whole chunk that's missing. Um, with Delay tolerant networks, which is a software application of radio hardware, uh, you can do things like like I can be in the middle of the mountains, I can want to send information, data, whatever I want um, to other ham radio operators or 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 wherever I want to send it, and I can get it ready to send, but I I may not have a connection to anyone, but someone comes down the road, you know, in the back country. Um, they make connection with me. They have a Faraday ra radio or just a ham radio in general that has this capability. Um, and we make that connection. It says, hey, I, I, I'm driving and hey, I want to send this data. Let me take the information that you have, store it in my, in my car, in, in the radio in my car. And when it drives into a city, it downlinks the data and, and it gets out into the information in, in, into the world. On the reverse side, everyone now knows where you were uh, hiking. Uh, uh, and because, you know, at least in Faraday, we have a GPS on board. Uh, so it can say, well, I want the return data on the back end to be loaded onto other people or cars that might be in the area in the future. Or they might and be heading that way. Might be heading that way. And when, when they make connection with me again, maybe this is hours later, we make the connection and go, oh, hey, here's your data. Maybe I sent the email or I want email back or, or, or whatnot. Um, and that, that's, that's a form of delay tolerant communication um, or like still and forward. There was actually, um, there was actually uh, AMSAT satellites uh, or just amateur radio satellites in general that used to have similar versions of technology. It's the old PACSAT back in the 90s. Um, and there were stories of people being in the middle of the um, Sahara Desert um, sending emails and, 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 and communicating within, within you know, these really remote places uh, by waiting for satellite passes. And they would wait you know, half a day to get, a, get, to get uh, re re replies. <laughs> uh, now, that's just one application of it, um, but it is an example of where when you boil down the, the ham radio versus the internet, you will lose every time except in these places. And when you, look at, uh, when you look at applications, well, okay, how can we apply ham radio and do fun things with it? So that is a backcountry use of it, um, and it's fine, kind of like an APRS use of it. Or and, and getting general data, but then how will contesting change? Because we have automated systems. Because now you no longer just have text to text keyboard digital mode. Now it is now we know your GPS location. We can make a verified connection. Because one of the things in ham radio that's holding us back is the is the use of encryption or the lack of use of encryption and authentication. I agree that encryption is probably not uh, applicable to ham radio, but if we can authenticate over ham radio and, and do that legally, then if I make a contact with you over digital radio, we can verify very accurately that we are who we say we are and we can verify instantly that that happened. Um, so how will, how will ham radio change based on these new uh, available abilities? 
And we're, we're talking ham radio for the 22nd century. Should we go that far? <laughs> I mean, com- well, compared, I mean, you know, you look at, yeah. say, like Arden, the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. I, I might have mm-hmm. said that wrong. Um, and I, no, I think I might have got it right. Anyway, to me, that's like packet for the 21st century. And, and it's, it's utilizing, you know, microwave versus the the old uh, the old packet nodes on two meters. This this may not be that, but it it feels like it's kind of uh, another progressive step in what's available with our with our limits that we're given with the FCC with our license as amateur radio operators. Well, when well, you look at when you look at like uh, Aridin or the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, right? It it was designed for a specific purpose, and that's emergency communications. And they utilize, uh, to my knowledge, they utilize um, you know off the shelf uh, um, like Wi Fi style hardware, uh, like ubiquity bullets and stuff like that, um, which is fine. But it's one of the points that I, that we made earlier, uh, where um, that's great for generally the last couple hundred feet. It, if you want to go further, which you can in, with Air, with the uh, that network, you have to start using point to point, or you have um, one station has an omni antenna and the other one has like a, a a parabolic dish, right? And you have to have a line of sight, right? Um, it gets really tricky to to use that in general. If I'm just driving down the road, I'm not going to want to have a rotating like a rotator that's like pointing in a certain direction on my car, you know? Like it gets really tricky. So uh, it is essentially a ham radio version of say the internet, you know, you're doing ethernet and, um, uh, it, it's great. It is really useful in emergency situations when you can go set up a, like a base station and enable communications. Um, and I mean, I, I think it's a really, really cool project. Um, I wonder if, uh, future technology will, will start to encroach in that because you, you, you do see some of these commercial, um, as well as, uh, as, uh, I guess G, um, what's the, what's the non, um, government part? Uh, you, as I didn't expect that, uh, you, you see the, these, these non-governmental people like using satellites free of charge, right. To, in, in, in developing countries or, uh, emergency situations, which is becoming more commonplace. So I don't know if that is, is going to be an issue in the future for actual use cases of this stuff. But, um, you know, we have friends who, you know, did the ham net, um, you know, and, uh, was it broadband ham net uh, stuff? And they 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 pinged uh, uh, the router at the other end of it, and then said, "What do I do now? Like, why not just use the internet?" Which is a valid point. It's it's like, okay, well, you have this set up, and it's essentially um, a mesh network of you know of the internet, which um, you're then you spent all this time building this network, but then no one really knows what to do with it in the end um, uh, when when you when you just focus on building the network. Which is why uh, when when Brent and I uh, have started and, and continue to work on Faraday, uh, it's the focus is is very intently on applications. What are we doing with it? And yes, we we eventually want a an infrastructure, a network, but we need to make sure that the entire time we have some some clear intended applications of this. And yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll add this one comment of of the. Faraday is, is, is also looking to be an educational resource within the hobby. And that's one reason we did open source. Like literally you can go on our, our GitHub account and get all of the firmware, the software, the hardware files to make your own circuit board. It, it is completely open sourced. And the reason for that, um, among other focuses where we want to have smaller projects where we, you can see how we designed the software, the hardware, because we want we want ham radio to also remain the go-to hobby, even within digital technology. Of here's how you design and apply this technology um, in bite-sized chunks, and not just hey, go buy this Wi-Fi router. Because like I, I, lo- I would, I would seriously question if there are any people within sort of like the, the ham net, broadband net, who are building their own routers. And um, that's I know that's not the point of it, but we're locking ourselves into this commercial technology. Where if we look back at like, well, what problems can we also solve from an engineering side um, and make it simple and use ham radio in all these different ways, especially the last 10 miles that, that, that we're looking for at this point, um, um, there's a lot of cool engineering things that happen within circuits like Faraday uh, itself. So I've got uh, 
I've got the rural problem down here. Um, there's there's nothing internet wise. There's no network. Anything happening. Uh, I've got Arden nodes connecting my house to the barn, but I've still yet to get the internet connected to those. But I do have two two ends talking to one another. Um, but, but as I look at your project, um, the, I, I get what you're saying about the backcountry and, and taking traffic with you when you pass and whatnot. Uh, what are some other applications uh, for that in addition to learning the technology with the open source educational background? But if, if I'm a ham in 2017, 2018 looking to to further experiment locally, what can I do with the Faraday RF radio boards? Yeah. Uh, w- one of the things to remember is that this is a growing project, right? So we are still defining certain aspects of that. Um, we built the hardware and we provide the hardware on, on our website. Like, I mean, it's open source. Anyone can actually build just like, order their own boards and build it. Um, but you know, manufacturing hardware is actually kind of tricky. Um, so, so we do it professionally, uh, and therefore, like we, we don't mind um, providing this so people don't have to do that. Um, and the main, some of the main thrusts of the project are software uh, and actually defining those, those use cases. Um, so uh, the, the delay tolerant networks is, is certainly one of the big ones we're looking at. Um, uh, there's certainly, I mean, there's, there's, you know, this is more of a, a wishful thinking at the moment. Like, like it's also like far down the road, but like the idea of putting this technology on satellites is really interesting. Um, and, uh, also we're kind of hardware agnostic. So, um, the Faraday project is, is more of like an ideology. Um, it is, it is meant to be educational. It's meant to, to, um, to provide access to say, uh, networks or, or infrastructure that is not really tied to certain frequencies. So the idea of um, in the future coming out with lower bandwidth, but you know lower frequency uh, hardware that just plugs right into that 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 whole network is is actually pretty it's pretty clear to to ha- how to get there, um, and that that can be a powerful thing for people looking for if they want to build a project that can plug into a, a new infrastructure or or uh, bring the hobby forward. Um, there's something there. There's like, there's, there's these, there's these low hanging fruit of, um, Hey, this is on 33 centimeters. Um, I want to do a radio, but I don't want to do it on 33 centimeters. I want to do it on this frequency or that frequency. Uh, that's kind of a cool outlet, uh, from an educational standpoint, or at least a project standpoint. And I know, um, Brent, Brent has done a lot of thinking about this as well. Uh, so I'll let him take it. Uh, yeah. And to, to, to clarify some of the educational side, we are still growing and, and we've actually gone onto a, onto a new sort of uh, push on our side. We finished, and as you can see in the website and, and, and blog posts, we've, we've done a lot of, on the telemetry side and making this initial push of like integrating, in, integrating into the APRS network. Um, but we've actually gone on to a more clear and, and simplified side that focuses on education where we are making Faraday look like simply a network card in your computer, and it uses uh, um, it uses si- simple software interfaces uh, and, and programming like Python, which is pretty easy to learn. Um, and where the education comes in with that is is if you take a, a, a experimenter or ham radio experimenter and say, okay, well, if I how would I make a digital ham radio, and what would I do with it? Um, we plop down this radio hardware, what we're showing in, in, in open source and, and also in clear small projects and small modules, um, what we're showing is, okay, you have this hardware that has this interface to your USB port. You can take and make these, these software interfaces that allow you to connect to your radio or any radio. Like, like you, you, as long as you have uh, a, a, a digital radio front end, you know, if you have a software-defined radio and... You, your USB takes in characters or bytes and it sends out radio transmissions, there's no difference. So you, the building blocks are the same. And um, then you can take uh, these Python modules and say, okay, well, I want to make this network interface card using this software technology. I can then make these applications to do to connect to delayed tolerant networks or send out telemetry or to connect to another person and download a file. Um, and um, 
those are some of the educational ba- um, uh, uh, abilities, uh, educational abilities that that are enabled. Now, I think it's it's in that way you can look at Faraday as sort of a platform for a ham radio, uh, where I, I hate to use this terminology, but like if you were to think of like Arduino and what that did for uh, for for electronics in general, it allowed it allowed people to take bite-sized chunks of projects and do those projects really quickly and learn along the way. And that's what our initial goal for, for Faraday from an educational point is, is to break down these barriers for ham radio and say, let's give you the platform and give you the ideas of how you can apply these platforms within radio. And as the community grows, and it, it is definitely growing, um, you will have more things to do and more ways to experiment. Whether you want to just get on and transfer files or talk to someone, you know, across the country or across your town, uh, or whether you want to experiment and say, well, how fast can I make this happen? Um, you know, there are interesting things like, like, like you can use multiple, you could use multiple Faradays together, put them on separate frequencies and have different stations hop between Faradays and you could support multiple people um, on one repeater site. That's pretty cool. So there's just, it, it's, it's really the foundation of potential, unlimited potentially projects regarding ham radio, communications, digital voice, digital data, uh, a combination thereof, as simple as you want to make it uh, point to point, or it could be as broad as you could afford to build it. Yeah, it's it's important to remember that Faraday RF is is we kind of tend to look at it as a like an educational company, right? It is is kind of our, our our main point of of how we kind of view ourselves that we provide hardware, but we don't really want to necessarily only do that. Like we want to build a a new not a new version, but we want to we want to enable our view of what ham radio could be. And that's by providing the hardware, we do that. And then also by working on the software uh, that goes with it, we are, are helping show people, uh, and we're in learning ourselves, I've learned a ton doing this, um, how we should view the hobby, right? Um, I, always, I always like to look at how um, Faraday uh, right now goes on APRS, um, which APRS is a, is a cool system, but, um, when you look at a Faraday radio, it looks like any other APRS radio. It you don't know it's on thirty three centimeters, um, and that's because I just it just interfaces over Python with some sockets. Um, that when a radio hears another station, it takes the, it takes the packet and basically sends it into the APRS network and puts it on there. Like it's just it's software. Like making uh, making these steps and building these systems to be interoperable is really a software problem. Um, uh, Brent and I, you know, one of the things that we, we often will, will talk about too, is the whole, uh, idea of, uh, non-interoperability, right? Like people often will complain, you know, D star and DMR or, uh, system fusion, these things don't talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yes, there's the technical aspects of different modulations, different schemes like that. And there's, I'm sure there's political aspects to it too. People don't want these networks to be combined, but like, there's really no reason why we can't build something that allows other other projects to talk to like uh, I would love like we use 2FSK right now it's a form of GMSK it basically the same modulation that um, a similar modulation to how DSTAR works it's that type of modulation scheme um, like there's no reason someone can't build a version of Faraday that uses QPSK or BPSK and it literally looks the same. Like, sure, it can't talk to my radio hardware, but over over the network, over the back end that uses, say, the internet or some Ethernet protocols, um, once it reaches, say, land, uh, it's all packets at that point, and you can switch between networks. And this should be, we should view ham radio as this this. A build, this medium that we can build upon to do things with. It doesn't have to be like, oh, well, my radio doesn't talk your modulation, so I can't talk to you. It's like, well, the why don't we just all meet on one common layer, like the internet, essentially, or at least Ethernet. It doesn't have to be the internet. It could just be an Ethernet network. Um, and then 
when we all agree upon that, then we can go between each other's modulation schemes like no problem. Um, to me, that's an exciting, um, exciting thought. Well, to remove that that wall of having just looking at it from a dollars and cents perspective, instead of having to buy four different walkie-talkie, handy-talkie radios that do these four different modulation schemes, you could have one. Of course, the, the the big three won't like that, but you could have one that would be able to talk between them all. And um, I mean, I know there's some technology similar that's, that's doing that now, uh, but you could you could have that, and it would it would break down some of those barriers and allow you to uh, to make those contacts or the data points or whatnot to to grow out what you're thinking about doing. And yeah, we've helps. we've we've kind of viewed it as um, we've kind of viewed it as. Uh, you know, the whole like, um, don't ask for permission, you know, ask, you know, <laughs> ask for forgiveness, right? Um, where, you know, yeah, technically we're building another, like another protocol or essentially another way to talk radio. But I guess the big difference on ours is ours is like actually open. And the idea of it is just meet, basically meet, meet on a, you know, local interface like, like, like Ethernet. And as long as your communications are there, essentially, it doesn't matter what radio you are. It doesn't matter. Like interoperability shouldn't shouldn't be what modulation you use. It, you should be agnostic to that. And uh, and that ideology is something we're, we're really excited about. Where um, people can just come and build a project that, as long as you talk in this way over, say, uh, uh, an API, no one cares. Do what you do whatever you want on the radio. Like whatever modulation scheme, band, frequency, whatever, as long as you talk, say this API, you're good. We can all we can all communicate. Yeah, um, um, and and I think it's important to note that when we say interoperability, we don't just mean on the radio waves on on our app. It is interoperability doesn't mean that the you can transmit um, multiple multiple radio modulations. Maybe they are incompatible from a, or, or an RF perspective, but on the back end through the internet, or let's say you set up a ham, a ham um, net uh, backbone RF, so you don't even actually use the internet, but it's all based on IP, and you can interact with each other on the on on an application level and transfer. So like 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 your landline phone still talks to cell phones. They are two very different technologies, but they meet at a common layer in software. And that's where we're bringing ham radio. Um, um, and I, I like to point out, Kale, uh, because you, you keep using the term um, making contacts or data points and, and that um, something very important to realize about where we're trying to bring Faraday and ham radio is that we are challenging the notion within radio of making a contact that you actually physically do that. Like right now, all these digital modes that, that are out there that are very popular, FT8, uh, PSK, they all use the human as the sort of operator. And where the newer technology, digital technology is, is bringing radio, like Faraday is very much like um, a Hamnet. Like you are not actively making the message transactions between Hamnet. You know, you're, you're just using the application. And... What it's really challenging is this notion of making a contact or being real time with that communication. So how can we use ham radio in non real time applications or in semi real time applications? I might be talking to you, uh, but maybe I leave a message. Maybe I have a, a remote station that I may not be physically at all the time. Um, yeah, uh, really sort of pushing a little bit more of like the automation within ham radio and seeing, let's focus on the application side. How can we make ham radio fun using new technology? I love it. I mean, yeah, I get what you're saying, and thank you for that correction or, or bringing that out, because it is it is so much more. That you're, like you said, we, we have we have all these abilities. I think even in some of your, your papers there on your, your website, you know, we, we have this band that we really don't even participate in, but we we can do all sorts of things in it if we'll just start doing it. So let me ask you this: Here I am on my farm. Uh, there's not any connectivity down here at all. 
So what can I do with a Faraday RF set of radios uh, on my barn, on my farm, around my barn, around the house, uh, a local hand? The, the closest one I have is about four and a half miles away. Um, what kind of ways could we use this to enhance our hobby uh, and enjoyment with ham radio and Faraday RF? Uh, so right right now, uh, we one of the main aspects we've, we've developed for it uh, is telemetry. Um, now, we're great for a whole other discussion is this next push we're moving on to uh, for general data. But um, as the software in, uh, is currently designed, um, we essentially are a very, very nice um, uh, APRS uh, uh, module at the moment. And so we can send uh, some... Uh, high accuracy, uh, 12-bit ADC measurements, so te- telemetry of temperature, anything that you, you can hook up to it, essentially, uh, we do that, and it goes several miles. So um, you, can, you can essentially track things or, um, and basically look like an APRS station with, with telemetry. So uh, one of the things that we actually provided that's open source is uh, telemetry.faradayrf.com, which is... Um, Still, it's very much in beta, so you know sometimes it just goes down. But um, it is a a new way of looking at APRS data. Like, let's make data centric, uh, and you can look at all the graphs on it, and it it allows you to see uh, a kind of a whole new view of what um, of what what data looks like in terms of ham radio. Uh, so those are some things you can do immediately right now, um, and uh, it kind of just fits in to the APRS network. Um, but uh, again, this is a uh, not our day job. <laughs> uh, and it's very much a, you know, it, it is something that uh, I would always love to put more time into, but oftentimes, uh, uh, oftentimes <laughs> SpaceX takes uh, precedence. Uh, actually, every time SpaceX takes precedence. So, um, you know, sometimes it gets hard and waxes and wanes in terms of the development there. But uh, it's, we're certainly on a pretty clear path as what to what we are working towards. And uh, I'm pretty proud of what, what it does right now. And um, I think Brent Brent will probably have a few comments on that, but it's it's capable right now as uh, essentially a very very nice APRS tracker uh, that we have we have com- had to communicate uh, reliably over 24 miles. Now that's line of sight, so you have to have some elevation advantage there. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, from uh, from a a 60 foot advantage, so you know, top of a house or whatever a hill. Uh, you can easily go 10, 20, 10, 12 miles um, in the line of sight. Um, you get those advantages uh, with with that, um, and you don't have the whole uh, APRS AFSK kind of fun. That at least you you have it, large issues with AFSK here in the Los Angeles area um, you guys are on the saturated. APRS network. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's hard. Um, I would I would go hike with my uh, my Yesu VX 8R. Um, on the mountains here in Los Angeles, so I'm like next. I'm I'm like mile or two away from the repeater sites, and every five minutes I'd send out a packet. And after like a six hour hike, maybe maybe ten packets got in. Wow. The rest of them just like it. That that was one of the things that, that was one of the reasons we looked at at, at this problem and said, how can we solve this? Because you know, say the delay tolerant networks and stuff like that is those would solve these problems or. Um, like Faraday's hardware and something we very much plan on actually implementing uh, as as we make progress uh, is things like TDMA um, or where you are you are you are actively managing who talks when so that you you minimize the 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 conflicts and you you optimize how many stations and how much traffic you can handle at once. Nice. Yeah, uh, I'll add in there that um, that Cal. Uh, uh, Bryce overviewed very nice uh, what you can currently do with it, uh, and a lot of that too was us learning how how to how to be software programmers because uh, we're hard work by nature, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 um, yeah, I'd love to have a whole talk on where we're going and uh, um, oh, absolutely. basically where 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 we see Faraday in the next two to four months being able to do um, is. Y- Hook it up to your computer, a computer, Raspberry Pi, your main desktop, laptop, whatever, um, and it will look like a network card, like a network interface that you plug your internet into. Um, and you can then uh, um, interact with it uh, with applications that 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 either uh, you know 
that use standard TCP IP. You know, you could think do things, but if you have two computers, uh, you should be able to just open up like FileZilla and transfer files between them, or like or, IRC, or IRC, and have a communication between IRC and IRC between these two units. You will never know that this is a radio link. It just looks like a network interface, but it has no internet connection, and because it's just between these radios. Um, and then there are other applications um, that will, you can, you know, that may be more radio centric, um, maybe implement delay tolerant networks. Um, maybe you can uh, set up, you know, your own little uh, in intranet or something, but the, the, the options are, are all there. Um, where we're pushing is to do a generic, like wireless modem, where the, the world is your oyster and you can just build Build what you want, um, and we'll we'll be there building. Uh, but it, if you want to do digital voice, um, that application uh, platform that we're building will allow you to do that, and and we can show you how to do that on 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 our website. Uh, that's one of our goals that we will do is to use um, open source codecs to go and transfer digital audio between you know live between multiple Faradays, and. Yeah, um, I forgot my next point I was going to make, but I think I'll wrap it up on that. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's it been talking for a while here. <laughs> yeah, it, it helps bring it in. Yeah, exactly. And uh, speaking of SpaceX, we know that they do come first, and you guys have been so gracious with your time. I, I would like to f further investigate this and get, get your next steps out um, at another time when we have time. But you're, you're doing exactly what I thought you were doing. And it's not something that I could sit down and explain to my wife. She wouldn't be interested anyway, let's be honest. But I couldn't explain it to her. But I can now further and better understand where you're going, the mindset behind it. And it's very exciting because, again, going back to the very first part of a conversation we've even had is, wow, what about the youth? What are we going to give them to do? I mean, they might not be interested in learning CW or or get it on FT8 and making these contacts all over the world. But if we can put something in their hand that will give them an opportunity to connect with another person or a station uh, to pass data voice or anything, or even leave it running while they're at work, working on satellites or, you know, rocket ships, this gives them an opportunity that to participate in this and take the hobby to the next level. I, to me, it's extremely exciting, and I'm really stoked that you guys are doing this. Thank you. Cool. Thank um, you. And, and actually, uh, uh, that brought up a, a, a point that, you know, someone asked me once, how, how what, what would make me realize that we were successful in Faraday's project? And, and for me personally, um, I would consider that as, as if, 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 especially younger people, maybe college age, are using ham radio, especially Faraday would be, would be, you know, the example here, um, to, not only have fun and and participate within within ham radio, but also to learn and develop their electronic skills and engineering skill sets, and be use the hobby as a medium, like it has always been, to experiment with electronics in a more relevant way. I think that's a win in in my book, um, and I think I think you're right that um, um, I think we need to accept that the next generation of ham radio may not want to learn CW. They may not want to just make contacts per se. Maybe the, their hobby will change. And actually, one of our largest challenges within Faraday is not technical, it is social. Mm. And, and um, yeah, people are very afraid of, of sort of like their hobby as if, as if you know, it's, it's one person's hobby changing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a very interesting conversation to have with people. Yeah. I think it's important to also note that, like, we're not saying people shouldn't talk, like, CW and stuff. It's like, you do what you want. It's just that may not be the focus in the future. Yeah. Yeah. You exactly. you guys are, are trying to fill a niche that maybe have, hasn't even shown up yet, but in oh, advance. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting exactly. stuff, man. Well, I know that both of you have a lot to do today. Uh, we here appreciate your, your time and really would like to come revisit the future of Faraday RF in, the, in our very near future. And uh, thank you again. It's been a blast having both of you. Again, the first brothers, the first twins, the first consecutive call signs, and the very <laughs> first rocket. What, what is the, what's the joke? It's uh, 
<laughs> it's rocket surgery. Our first rocket surgeon yeah. here on the show. Guys, thank you both very much. No problem. Hey, yeah. thank you too. You're welcome. Have thank a good you. one. I think their parents would be very proud of them. <laughs> they've done a, they've done a quite a job, and uh, still doing. I mean, you think about it, rocket scientist. That's that's a pretty good, pretty good position to be in, especially uh, when you're working SpaceX. So thank you, Brent and Bryce, for being here with us. We appreciate you hanging out, uh, helping us further understand not only the millennials, but uh, learning more about ham radio in the future as uh, as we all try to get there. So thanks for that. Uh, as well as thank you for listening. Thank you for your support of the show. Uh, we are Ham Radio 360, the podcast. You can find us online, hamradio360.com. I anticipate having the brothers back on pretty soon. I, I don't know how soon it'll be. But I anticipate sometime probably first or second quarter of this year to uh, have them participate with us again. I've got some more great stuff lined up. Please don't miss it. Share the show with your friends. Let them know that we're still here, still making great content, at least I think so. And hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time. 73, y'all. Thank you for listening. You can find more online at hamradio360.com. 73, y'all.